Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Todd Raymond. We have uh, Emma Swires here as well. Uh, a couple other people are going to do a little bit of speaking and joining in with us as well. Uh, Rob DeMarco, the uh, o- owner and one of the founders of AgriChem here, uh, as well as Megan Munoz uh, is with us To She is the lead lab tech to do a little describing of some of the products uh, and, and understanding as well that way. So we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, Again, here we're all here to take a look at the T-tip emollients, uh, understand a little bit more about how they fit in and what we're doing. So, what do we need and why? So, um, why do we dip? <laughs> um, so, the main reason is to sanitize, remove that bacteria to prevent any mastitis, clinical and subclinical. Um, we don't want to see our cows, you know, go past that 200,000 mark um, where we start to lose money. And the, we definitely don't want to see an increase in mastitis cases. Um, as we all know, that costs uh, the farm level a lot of money um, and can potentially get dealers kicked off if uh, they don't improve the mastitis cases. The other um, reason why we dip is to maintain good teat health. Um, So that hmm, keep good good conditioning um, when there's stress conditions um, and changes in the weather and environment. So in a dip, we have the germicidal uh, system, which is the killing component, um, colors and dyes to make sure that um, on the farm level, we can see if cows are getting dipped or not. Uh, The film forming polymers, um, sometimes the barriers, surfactants, uh, buffering agents, thickeners, and skin conditioners are a big um, impact in the dip, um, especially on the post side. We want to see um, that skin conditioner being at a good percentage, depending on uh, what the cows are going uh, through. Um, So any stress conditions, environmental issues, um, depending on what bedding is, maybe you want to put it at a higher percentage um, or find a dip that works for your, your farm. And now we're going to have our lab tech talk about uh, the different types of emollients, uh, additives. Okay, so when we're talking about the different emollients, we can break those down into different classes. So you'll see on the left, we have uh, the type of skin conditioner and then moving next to it, kind of what class it's under. So, for example, you have aloe vera, which is a humectant, which really is like a hydrator. Um, so then you can look at uh, it's a moisturizer. It, it hydrates the teats um, and a, a benefit of it could uh, would be that it would heal sky, uh, minor skin lesions. Uh, it can help treat the frostbite, sunburn, um, abrasions. It's it's like a first line of defense. Uh, you have your lanolin. This is occlusive. So a good way to think about that is that it creates a barrier. Uh, it's a protective barrier. So it's going to trap the moisture and help restore, um, uh, restore the moisture. And you would use this maybe a, a second level of defense, uh, you know, a little bit more severe skin issues. Um, it's a great uh, preventative option, but probably the best preventative option. Then you would have your glycerin, again, which is a humectant, so it hydrates. Uh, and uh, another good thing is that when you're thinking about a humectant, um, depending on the moisture that, uh, excuse me, the humidity that's in the air, it's going to either pull the moisture um from the air or it's going to pull it from inside under the skin your next level uh of uh, uh under the skin 
So it will um, do that relative to the con outdoor conditions. Um, and then we can look at propylene glycol. This is kind of a double emollient. It, it's a humectant and what they consider an emollient. Uh, this is a byproduct of glycerin. It draws and locks the moisture as well. And uh, it, it's good for anti-freezing properties. So uh, you can use that in different conditions, colder conditions. And we have sorbitol. Um, again, uh, this is a humectant. It's going to moisturize, hydrate. Um, this one, though, can also have what they would consider a calming or soothing effect on the teeth. Uh, we also use it as a thickener. Um, and one of the really positive things about the sorbitol is that um, through the science itself, it forms an antioxidant. And lastly, we have PVP, and this is a polymer. And again, it's a humectant, so it's working the same way to moisturize and hydrate. And it also works well with other emulsions. Um, it prevent, protects, prevents um, water loss. And this, just a really good point, is uh, film forming at 80% humidity, it will absorb. So, so looking at the glycerin and sorbitol, uh, a, a few of the things that have changed in this last year, we in the dairy industry have talked and, and used almost exclusively glycerin or glycerin blends with the propylene glycols and the sorbitols, lanolins, aloe veras, and, and had a, a good mixture of that. But in this year, the, the pricing has increased 50% and greater uh, over the last year to 18 months. Uh, we've seen the numbers just really go through the roof because it is a byproduct of uh, the diesel industry that way and such. And with all the clean diesel that's being done, the processes and availability of what's there has changed, uh, uh, changing our pricing structures throughout it all. So it's caused a lot of move in products to sorbitol, propylene glycol. Again, the same thing with propylene glycol. Pricing went through the roof on that as well. So when we look at products that we have in our uh, in our products today or, or emollients that we have in our products today, we are using a lot more sorbitol than we have in the past. That is a product that's been used throughout our systems, but not quite as exclusively as it is today. Uh, and a lot of that's the, because the pricing has remained steady on that. So when we look at the two of these together, uh, we have the uh, the fact that the glycerin is absorbing moisture, as uh, Megan said, from the air and from the skin. So depending on the conditions, it's working in both directions for us to its best advantage that way. Where the sorbitol, we have uh, the, those same humectant type of properties, but what we're looking at with this is that those healing properties as well. Uh, and really beneficial for those dry skin conditions. So it in the past, I guess we could say the sorbitol has been maybe even a little bit higher on the scale of availability and uh, in product uh, strength and in key focuses that we can use. But because of the cost advantages of glycerin, propylene glycols and others, we use those consistently. And now with the market having changed, we have a really great product with Sorbitol, as well as the fact of pricing in this is now our pricing advantage to be able to use in it. So several of our products still have a, a blend with some glycerin. We're still using propylene glycol, uh, still using the lanolins and, and, and aloes where necessary in there. Uh, but Sorbitol has really taken a, a greater space as far as the percentages that are in there at this point. So I'm not sure where everyone's from on this call. However, we are in upstate New York where we have just experienced our first winter storm. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately with that, Last week it was 70 degrees and now going down to 30 degrees, that's a huge stressor for cows um, and one we want to stay on top of. Um, and this definitely should impact emollient packages in our dips. Um, you'll start to see farmers move to their higher emollient packages, especially up here in New York. However, it's not uncommon for 
uh, all around the US to change their Molly packages during that winter time. I know California experiences super wet conditions, uh, really muddy in those dry um, in the packs. So um, it really depends on where you're at, but typically for a New York dairy farm, uh, we run around 5% emollient packages uh, through the summer. And in those spring and fall conditions where it's a little more variant, uh, we'll run like a 7.5% emollient. And then in the winter, it can vary from 10 to 15%, uh, depending on the farm and what they're going through and their needs. Winter can be kind of a, a relative thing as well. When when we look at being here in New York State with experiencing our winter weather, we can have it be 30 degrees and windy and still be using a 10% dip uh, very easily because we have barns that we close up and get into that. Yet you get into the south and southwest, western territories, a 30 degree day with a 30 mile an hour wind really can uh, really cause havoc for the animals, skin conditions and such that way, whether it be from from snow and weather or wind wind driven sands and dust and in dry areas that way can even cause uh, aggravation that way as well. So so when we look and we're talking about winter dips, it's not necessarily just the cold, it's also cold for us, we may say, hey, we're, we're looking at using a winter dip with a 50% emollient package at below zero. Another market, it may be 30 degrees. So so keep that in mind really as to where you are in your market as to how you're looking at that. And, and as Emma said, when we get into each area, depending on your, your wet weather or your dry season, you may each have a different market that you have to look at these products for. And, and we'll kind of go through it as a, a general discussion on the winter side of things that way. So I'd also like to point out that every farm is different. Uh, management styles, what they use for bedding, what how they're prepping teats, uh, what teat conditions are like. Um, and even in the summer months, some of the farms have stayed consistent with that 10 percent because they're having teat end issues and they want to repair those teats, uh, making sure that they get the animals happy again um, and get them in good, healthy conditions. It's I, just going back to that last slide too. I'd say one one uh, big thing to look for is the, uh, the the humidity level. That really makes a huge difference. You can tell at least here in New York State and, and across the Midwest when the humidity drops as that cold um, cold air uh, comes through and you'll see it in you know you'll see it in your own hands your own hands will typically start to dry out and you'll start to have to use a moisturizer yourself and that's um, that's the same effect that's that's happening to the animals as well So, so some of our common winter dip questions that we have uh, that, that come up through it all, and, and I'll just throw all the questions out here and then we'll go one by one and kind of go through with some thoughts and some ideas for each of these. So can I use the same dip I've been using? Uh, and, and Emma just made some really good points here in the Northeast. We tend to use a 5% a dip uh, in the good weather, the good seasons, and when it gets to be a difficult season, we're using that 10% dip to, to add as a little better protection, bringing in those skin conditioners and really, really helping to keep that skin healthy. Uh, so there is some variation as to what you're using through all of that. So uh, what, what if I've been using barrier dips? Can we continue those throughout the winter? We'll get some answers on that as well. Uh, should I use dips that are marketed for winter use, meaning those real high emollient winter dips, the 50, 70, 80 percent emollient packages? What's the real reason for those? And can I add extra emollients on my own? We see a lot of concoctions where you'll say I'm going to use my same dip I've been using, but I just want to add some emollients to that. Can I do that? So we'll go through each of these now in a little more detail. So most days, at least in this market, it's not cold enough to freeze uh, the dip right on the end of the teat. So in short, 
in most of your winter conditions, yeah, you can use the dips you've been using with slight variations. If you're using an iodine or a, a chlorine dioxide and you've been using a 5%, maybe jumping to the 7, 10 in that range is a good way to go. Uh, but when we get that cold wind, cold, the wind chills, the direct exposure, and it, after the, the post milking side of things, we want to make sure we're dabbing or wicking the, the end with a cloth towel, getting things as clean as we can if in a case that way. And it takes very little time and effort. We want to make sure uh, we're, we're taking care of all, all aspects of that. So we want to remove, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so it, it's been proven to work in that aspect, taking very little time and effort. So make sure we're getting that, uh, not, not wiping off the dips and conditioners and leaving it on there at that same time, getting a good heavy coating applications, the real key at this point on this one. So, so barrier dips. So several different types of barrier dips that we have even in our lineup, but in others as well. So depending on who's you're using that way, when we're looking at the dips, barriers tend to dry slower. You've got uh, polymers in there for film forming agents. You've got a lot more thickeners in there to give a good heavy dip and have them staying on there. So slow drying dips will give you a nice coverage and stay on as a full protectant but it can also leave the teats wet as they're heading out. So if you have an exposed area uh, where they're out in the open, they're getting through the winds and such, that wet teat can actually freeze and have an issue quicker than if it were a dry dip on there protecting that way. So, so the slower drying dip leaves the wet teats exposed, cows are returning to their areas, generally not recommended if it's staying wet in that sense because of what it can do with the freezing. Uh, some barriers, however, that are faster drying or specially designed with winter applications in mind, meaning more emollient packages and more such that way. So definitely best to be checking and making sure you've got the best options that are out there. We're going to go through our dips, uh, give you some ideas as to what's good here and there in into each of the markets and areas as we go through this a little farther. Should I use the winter dips? So winter dips are especially designed for the extreme cold conditions, not to protect the cows from the cold, not only to protect the cows from the cold, but also to protect the, the teat skin from that wind chill. So in this case, we're putting a product on there that's not necessarily gonna dry in that, that same aspect of what we were just talking about, the barriers. It's leaving that heavier wet film but now we're using that wet film based on the propylene glycols and other emollient packages, which have those antifreeze tendencies. They're built in that form to allow us to keep that protected layer and to keep it in that point to make it work, work well for us. And can I add extra emollients on my own? So the, the never add skin conditioners to the dip on your own. We don't want to have that saying of too much is a good thing. Uh, so if you're just going ahead and saying, hey, I've got a nice iodine dip here. I've got a chlorine dioxide dip that's got a 5% emollient and I'm going to toss a, what I have in a in a good skin conditioner. I'm going to go to the beauty store down the road and buy something and put it in there. You have to be careful in being having the right products and the right items when you put these things together to make sure that you're not using something that's going to uh, affect the kill factors of your dip. You want to make sure you're not uh, ruining those bacteria, bacteria fighting properties that are in there. So definitely make sure as we're doing this. That being said, if you're using a product that's designed in that form, we have more and more uh, concentrate products that we do add emollients to and that do allow for a variation for you depending on your weather to say I'm going to use a a uh, iodine or uh, high hydrogen peroxide chlorine dioxide dip in a concentrate form and I'm going to go with a low emollient package in the summer and as the weather changes I'm going to continue to add my emollients that is a form that is a good way to go about doing it where it's it's managed and it's built into the program and the product is designed for use that way. So short answer is don't do it if it's not designed for it. 
Um, so we just wanted to point out some of the uh, different kinds of dips here um, where you have the iodine and chlorine dioxide, which are going to have more of a higher kill um, versus something like chlorhexidine uh, is going to be a little more gentle and not kill as much. However, it might uh, work well with that emollient package. So, and I'll, I'll just take a moment to uh, go over a few of these germicide uh, disinfectant properties and how emollients can also be required to counteract some of the um, some of the negative effects of these. So if you consider a product like iodine, which in and of itself is is highly acidic and requires acids uh, in order to solubilize in addition to necessarily the use of a high amount of surfactant. Um, iodine is extremely um, can be extremely irritating dry and drying uh, by itself. So we will often need the highest amount of emollient, such as uh, glycerin, um, sorbitol, or or even some um, some lanolin to counteract the negative effects of iodine. Um, chlorine dioxide, although it is on the acid side, uh, does not require as much of a surfactant, um, if any at all, um, other than to, to help it foam. So you, you don't necessarily need as much um, uh, skin conditioner to, to counteract chlorine dioxides. Uh, chlorhexidine, uh, the pH of, of, the, of this product tends to be around six to seven. So a little closer to neutral, not uh, as much surfactant required as iodine. Um, so not necessarily. And uh, a good option for um, it, it, chlorhexidine can be a good option because it is uh, not irritating at all. Uh, now, hydrogen peroxide, although that's going to be on the uh, acid side as well, again, not as much as iodine. Um, one thing we do as well is we pH balance our hydrogen peroxide um, closer to that six range. Uh, then you get into the fatty acids, the lactics, uh, salicylic glycolics, and although these are acids, they still um, they what they actually have is skin conditioning properties. So they're actually improving the cellular matrix. And they're actually helping the skin to be able to uh, become more hydrated, uh, especially when there's emollients and, and humectants that are added to the dip. And then lastly, sodium hypochlorite, your bleach, that is going to be up there with iodine as one of the most irritating um, and drying of, uh, of the germicides. So as you can see, in addition to weather, um, you you have to we have different package skin conditioning packages based on the germicide and and just the need to counteract some of the negatives from those. So what have we got that's changing in the dip market? These are some of the factors that are probably best to look at, even with the thoughts of uh, the emollients here. So. The raw material increases. So iodines, we've seen 25 to 30 percent increases, even more going up in each of those. So, so you got the uh, the the cost of iodines going up, the cost of prop propylene glycol going up at 100 percent, maybe even more from what it was a year, year and a half ago. Glycerin going up to that 50 percent more than it was in the past as well. So all these raw material costs are causing a lot of people to look at their dips and say if they've been using a 10 percent to say, let me try a 5 percent or if they're using a 5 percent, let me try a 2 percent. So if you've done that this year or had customers that have done that to look at reducing co uh, costs to, to cut product, Make sure you're keeping that in mind as you go into the winter if there's some issues that arise or try and get back to a point of having a, a, a proper level of what you need. So material shortages, we'll just hit on that as well in the, the dip market. Definitely have had some things come up with that. Uh, iodine's been in limited supply. 
A lot more people looking at chlorine dioxides, peroxides in the fatty acid dips uh, and options in that as well. So, so keep that in mind. And as Rob pointed out, there's a lot of variations when it comes to uh, what we're using for packages for emollients to, to vary through that. A lot of the similar things, same basic products, but we want to make sure it's measured to the right T-dip. So. And freight costs, so with freight rates increasing, fuel surcharges being added, and shortages of loads and such that are out there. Uh, good thing to keep in mind as we were talking about the, can we add emollients to our packages? Looking at uh, concentrated dips and concentrated options and adding additional emollients gives you the variability on price. It also helps to overcome some of these freight costs. Automated spraying systems. So we're finding more and more uh, with labor being an issue as we see in raw materials and freight and all the other things we're looking at. A lot more automated systems going in than there has been in the past. So if you're working with um, automated spraying systems, keep in mind uh, these, these are running products that are generally designed on a lower cost basis because we're running a higher volume. So they tend to have a lower emollient package in them. Uh, they have a less focused application. It may be more spraying just an area, and if the cow's moving around, you're getting a consistent level, but maybe not the same level as if you have a conscientious person doing the dipping. So you may see some changes in that if you've recently changed to that. And then uh, that increased consistency when they're set up correctly, if you're having a struggle with labor and such that way and you do get the consistency with an automated sprayer, you can look at this in both directions. But we're pointing that out in the emollient package section here to, to make that point that when it comes to automation, a lot of people are using lower emollient packages. So keep in mind that you're going to want to make sure that you increase those amounts in the midst of it or make sure the other areas of struggle from uh, the stresses the cows that are under or the barns or locations are well kept enough to offset that. Um, so this past week I was at a mastitis program um, just talking about the things that cause mastitis. Um, definitely it's a whole program. There's not just one thing that causes mastitis. mastitis. Uh, it definitely can be, but it's definitely a balance of your program. Um, and the type of management that's going in. Um, you have the environment, your bedding, um, and keeping that in a consistent basis uh, to prevent any environmental mastitis. Um, and then milking procedures are super key in terms of contagious mastitis um, and keeping cows happy and making the tea ends uh, really uh, have good condition to them. One thing that was mentioned this past week when I was at this mastitis conference um, is that a mastitis case costs four hundred and forty dollars uh, in total cost of lost milk, future costs, uh, potential uh, to call the cow. Um, so it's definitely something that can really economically impact the dairy farmers uh, hugely. Um, and then there's the many microorganisms that are known to cause mastitis, uh, such as Staph aureus, Staph uberus, um, or Strep uberus, <laughs> sorry, um, and just so many more. Uh, so we really want to make sure that we're still uh, killing those organisms on the dip um, with our dip or preventing those organisms from getting into the tea ends. Um, and when somatic cell goes up, our premiums are going down um, and the farm is losing money. Uh, that's definitely something that we don't want to see. So uh, making sure that TNs are in good, healthy condition is going to try and prevent some of those uh, things. So, so not every cow that has a, uh, a bad teat end has mastitis or has bad teats has mastitis. But if you look in the... Uh, mastitis pens and sick pens on a farm, most of the cows that have mastitis are going to have some sort of, or, or I should say many of the cows are going to have some sort of teat end issue. So 
there's a lot of correlation here and making sure you're really keeping on top of these teat conditions will really affect the mastitis and teat dip bottom, uh, the, the bottom line as far as your costs that way. So. It also affects the happiness and less stress on the cows. Um, going through that parlor, they're not going to kick as much. They're just going to be more calm and really enjoy the experience of going through the parlor rather than uh, being really stressed out because their tea ends hurt. And going through the parlor, it makes it pain a painful experience for those cows. Um, so like... Uh, Todd had mentioned before, um, there's many uh, different ways to put on a uh, tea dip. Uh, you have spray, you have foam, you have a dip cup, you have brushes, some uh, wipes that are a little less uh, seen now, but uh, more and more as labor is an issue, we see uh, the automated um, options that uh, reduce labor on the farm, uh, such as the teat liner application and automated spray system. I still, I, I will say this about those, uh, we haven't quite perfected it yet, so there is still opportunity um, with those systems. However, uh, just from my experience, the dip cup has always been uh, the most successful in coverage um, and keeping it consistent on teats. And to the right is just some things that uh, would be helpful to ask a farm. Um, is the pro while you're going through a farm or a problem farm, are the product going on every tea? Is it wet? Is it too dry um, in terms of foam? Um, if you're too wet, you're going to be flying through product. If it's too dry, it's not going to get that full coverage um, and as much kill. Uh, if it's not consistent, you're missing some of the cows. Um, and then just the coverage is just huge. If you can't get it on the cow, you can have the most effective dip in the world. It's no good if you have no, don't have good coverage. So a lot of times we'll find that someone is using an adequate product, but with inadequate coverage. So don't be too quick to just throw out the dip without looking at your application methods and seeing, do I need to change my method or do I just need to perfect what I'm doing and make it better? And I think when you go to these problem farms, it's a uh, key to look at those, the full management of the farm, not just uh, the teat dip aspect. It goes down to batting, it goes down to tea ends, it goes down to coverage. Um, it really looks at all aspects. What what type of bedding are you using? Are you using lime? I mean, there's there's aspects where if you're using an iodine and that iodine is coming in contact with lime in the bed, you can cause irritation and in trouble. So we, we have uh, things that we haven't addressed in this particular one of the warts on teats and the 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 lesions and things that we can get that way and and how are we dealing with those and how are we stopping contagious aspects of things that are affecting the skin as well. Uh, Emma's right in making sure we're managing this as an entire program. The dip is only a portion and it's a very valid, very important piece uh, in each of those areas, but it has to be combined with proper application, proper barn control, proper parlor maintenance, proper parlor uh, amount of milking time and such as well. So, so we just have an overview of our products here, a little bit of information on each one of them for you to see. The, the things that we're looking to point out here is like these are our iodine dips, our Bova Pro and our Smart Dip lines, a couple of different lines that we have with some slight formulation differences. But these are available in half percent and one percent mixes and in concentrates so that you can do them on farm or or at your uh, dairy supplier location as well. But they're available in all different levels of emollient packages. So depending, as Rob had pointed out, on the blending and in, in the, the, uh, the what you're using as far as as far as strengths and and such, you can vary what you is needed for each of those. So all varied in all different forms. But looking at the Bova Pro, we've got a, a superior softening and conditioning package with ours, uh, and we work very well with that. So great product to be using for the iodines uh, out there for you. 
So again, mobile pro and our economic line smart. So our Arctic Guard is our winter dip version. Uh, it's a safe, effective, economical. We're running with a 1% iodine in that and a 50% emollient package blend. So that is made especially for winter. It does have the propylene glycols and, and other products in it as well. It's got those antifreeze characteristics to it. So it's going to work very, very well uh, for keeping you protected from those wind conditions or those bitter uh, chill conditions as well. So ideal for the cold temperatures withstands the freeze thaw cycles. Uh, so it won't fall apart if it did happen to be stuck in an area where the product did freeze and uh, maximum skin conditioning and, and softening that way. So. So our peroxide based products, uh, our peroxides do have a lactic acid in it as well. So we've got a little bit additional property on that. Uh, Rob, you had mentioned yesterday on the peroxides that is pH balanced as well. Yeah, typically uh, peroxide at 1% plus the lactic is going to be uh, two or three pH. We actually bring it up to around six and that just makes it a, a gentler product. Um, so that's been something we've done for, for years with that and had a lot of, uh, a lot of success with it. So, so these are products that tend to get used a lot, uh, as a pre-dip product because of the cleaning ability of them. They got good foaming action, excellent cleaning properties and such that way. And they get used in a package that has a low emollient package to it. So whether it's a 2% or a 5% out there, and because you're putting it on and then taking it right back off as a pre-dip version, it's not quite as critical that way. But one thing to keep in mind when you're working with the peroxides and such that way, if you're using a peroxide as a pre and also peroxide as a post, or even getting into the chlorine dioxides and some of the others that have these nice drying properties in, in the cleaning aspect and such that way will have a tendency to have some of the, the drying piece to it to make sure your post dip is having a good offset for the emollient package uh, when you're using it. Still can be used through winter, still can be used through it all that way because it's coming on and coming off, uh, but make sure you're keeping your, your post dip side working well with it. So fatty acids, lactic based, as Rob pointed out, these particular products uh, are going to be able to have a a uh, conditioning pack or conditioning properties with them as well because of those uh, lactic acids that are in there. So while it's a low pH in an acid product, they are still very good in that way. Our two products for that are the Aura and the Prep 8X. So. Uh, Different packages available in the Aura. We do have that in a pre-post. Prep 8X has, depending on your market that you're in, has a, a 4 or an 8% emollient package. Uh, so a little bit more than some of the, the standardized pre-dip bases with the Prep 8X package that way, but does work very, very well. Very gentle to the skin on those. So Ultra Soft, this is a Bronopol one. This is essentially our highest emollient package dip uh, nice thick product good coverage it's going to stay on the teat very well this is a great product as far as giving something that's going to give nice barrier but also uh, gentle and and very good for the teat skin so chlorodynes uh, have traditionally been used in uh, treating warts and working in that aspect. It's also been a product that gets used a lot for those that have those allergies to iodines and other, other dips because of its gentle nature. So this one is known as a gentle product. Doesn't have quite the broad spectrum, so if you don't have a lot of issues as far as kill and such that way, again, another option of a good condition product. So. And then we have our chlorine dioxide dips. Uh, we have the extra blue that comes in a 6% emollient. The pre-post, that's a 12%, so it's going to condition a little bit more. Um, 
And then the 22C and the XT Ultra concentrates, which we are seeing become more prevalent in our industry, are concentrates because you can make them your own uh, own way and plus less shipping cost um, involved in that. And to your right, you can see our system that we use with that. Um, and we've had a lot of farms switch over to it and have a lot of good luck with having their own emollient uh packages that they can make custom to the, each farm so for our uh, concentrate packages the emollient additions that we're able to do we, we have a couple of them here so we have the emollient 80 and the premium 73 blends these are just conditioner packages so the initial one, the Emollient 80 blend, is a sorbitol blend product. Uh, has 80% of the, it is the conditioning package with just a small amount of water. So making it something that's cost effective for getting it out, but will also flow well when used in a situation where uh, you may have a, a utility room that's cold one day and warm the next. So it's going to flow well in all of that rather than using a, a 99 or 99.5% package that way. Uh, and then the premium 73. So that is built again with the sorbitol, glycerin, lanolin blends. Uh, that particular one has a 73% conditioning package. And as you add that to your dip, so if we were adding that to our uh, XT packages that Emma just was talking about in our XT Ultras and XT 22s, uh, if we're putting this in and you were to get that to a 10% dip or 10% emollient in the dip, you'll have 1% lanolin in that package. So it's built to give us that 1% lanolin uh, through the midst of all of that as well. So when adding these through our systems, the thing that we can point out in this, because we know our product going in, because we know our emollient package, we can take and add with this system in an according to oxide dip, a 20, 25, 30, 35% emollient package. So as the weather changes, we can be 2% in an area where it needs very low. We could be 20% when we have that stretch of winter that just gets to 20 below and it's bitter and you need to be protected and you don't have a winter dip there that you're using. We can we can make these blends and additions to make changes as needed. So. So the point of dip is to disinfect teats, um, not to clean teats. Uh, something I forgot to point out in the beginning of this presentation is that the dip is not to clean the teats. That's the wiping stage, um, using the towel, getting the debris off of the teats. The point of the pre-dip is to disinfect and um, kill any organisms um, on the teat. It's not to clean uh, clean off that manure or um, any of that, but adding the skin conditioning uh, to the post end and even to the pre end um, can help with that T end health um, and really uh, help improve the farm's uh, health of the overall cow. So, so in to add on that point of the dip not being to clean. You, you can see on our slides that we're talking about cleaning, we're talking about those properties, and we're using them to help us get that removing. But as, as Emma mentioned, it's the action of actually wiping and taking that off. That's the cleaning factor. So if you have a high organic load teat, really dirty, really messy, and you're starting to look at that, we're trying to kill a clean teat. So when you hear the, the veterinarians talking and the milk quality experts coming in saying, you need a dip strip dip program, that's the reason. They're putting the dip on the first time to give us the cleaning factor. But if you put that dip on and it's on the outside of all of that dirt and manure, and then you clean it off and you think you're done there, you really haven't gotten to that teat skin to do the sanitizing that needs to be done. That's where that second application of dip at that point to get that teat coated in a sanitized factor or disinfectant factor at that point is going to work very well for you. So. And it's important to have that prep uh, timed out well, uh, getting 30 seconds of coverage on that pre-dip side and then wiping the 
pre-dip off um, is super important to get all that kill um, on that tee. Exactly. Use it correctly. Take advantage of your timing. You, you need the time for the cows to let down anyway. So. All right. So that if anyone has any questions, uh, you can enter them now and we'll do our best to answer.